All right, we welcome the internet. We had a big Skype class today. It's growing. We're getting a lot of people on there now, different places, Kentucky and Florida and Ohio and everywhere else. So pray for the Skype class. And if you want to be part of the Skype class, all you have to do is ask. He'll call you and you go on. And it's live. You can talk back and forth. And uh, I preach for about, on Sunday morning, I preach for about an hour and a half. And on Wednesday night, an hour. Uh, one's at 6 on Wednesday and 9 o'clock on Sunday morning. If you're interested, we'll give you a phone number and the man will get you set up. Uh, in Hebrews 7, most people don't know that they've been put under the law, but they are. Uh, obviously, I, by confession of sins, because sin is a transgression also of the law. But if you would talk to the average person, they would say, you know, you've got to live by the commandments. And, of course, they don't know them, and they've never really sat down and read them. It would probably scare them if they really sit down and read the commandments. But what I want to do by the scriptures is prove the commandments are gone. They've been abolished, and there's something new coming. And it'll be by the name Judah. Okay? Hebrews 7, verse 14. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of, the, of, of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. Now, we have a religious system in the world today that is the leading religious system. Maybe not in numbers, but it leads the world. For its leader rules the world in religion, you might say. And they're priesthoods. And God did not give priests in this dispensation. And the priest he gave, we know by First Peter, we know by Hebrews, we know by Revelation, and we'll look at some things about it. But if the priesthood changed in the Bible, then there's something happened to the law. And it's scriptural. Turn to Hebrews 7, since you're there, verse 5. And verily, they that are of the sons of what? Okay. Big Mike, Levi. Little Mike, Judah. Both are tribes of Israel. They're both sons of Israel, Judah, uh, uh, which we know to be Jacob. Levi, Judah. Okay? Levi, according to this, verse 5, Verily, they that are the sons of Levi, who received the office of the, what? Priesthood. Priesthood have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of the brethren of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. Now, Abraham didn't have a law, a Mosaic law. That's Abraham's before Moses. But there was tithes given. Abraham gave tithes to somebody before the Levite priest. You see, the Levite priest were told they had no inheritance like the other tribes. Their inheritance was of the service of God. When you go, matter of fact, turn to Romans chapter 9. In Romans 9, verse 1, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, I have, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites. Now, Paul is a Benjamite. And uh, Benjamite had a problem in the Old Testament. And uh, we got, we're not going to go back there and read that, but uh, they had a real problem of a, something that they, a dirty deed they'd done. But of the tribe of Benjamin, but he is an Israelite nevertheless, because Israel contained the 12 tribes uh, Judah, uh, uh, Simon, you know, the names of them, Levite, all of them. Now look at verse 4 Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption? 
Now, as long as you have the availability of Israel, the adoption's there. And the adoption comes to an uncircumcised Gentile through blessing them. Genesis 12, I'll bless who blesses thee, curse who curses thee. In 1 Samuel 15, Saul, uh, Samuel went to Saul and he said, I want you to go over there. God says, you go over there and I want you to kill everything that breathes. Amukites, Amulekites or whatever. Or whatever, I can't remember the names exactly. You know, I don't want to misquote that to you. Uh, because who it is that he wants destroyed. Uh, yeah, Amalek. I apologize. He did, a, he did a really bad thing to Israel. And remember, I'll curse. I'll bless who blesses thee and curse who curses thee. Amalekites did not do it. And in 1 Samuel 15, 3, Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all they have and spare them not, but slay both man, woman, infant, and suckling, ox, sheep, camel and ass you know what God wanted he wanted them dead that's God God Samuel says you go over and kill them all why well it's because that they're going to grow up and afflict Israel and Israel's God's people now you understand when God's people are Israel you don't bother them he will repay. Folks, have you ever listened to what he says in Romans 12? Vengeance is mine, I will repay. Whoever's going to bother you one of these days is going to get tribulation. That's 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, chapter 1. Say, well, does that make it easy on you? No, we're counted as sheep for the slaughter. But what's going on around you, there is a vengeance coming. An evil world that's presenting themselves in their most evil way. One day God's vengeance is going to repay. What we have to do is trust the Lord totally in what he said he'll do. Thus you better get in that book and find out. I tell people you better study. You better look and you'll have comfort, in scripture, uh, comfort through the scriptures. But God, I mean you, you got Saul standing there and Samuel says, Go over and kill them all. I mean, kill them. And also, okay. So he went over there, and here comes a thought in verse uh, 6 of 1 Samuel 15. I'm just reading it to you. And Saul came into the, verse 5, city of the Amalek, Amaleks, and laid wait in the valley. And Saul said unto the Kenites, Go, depart, get you down from... Uh, among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. God didn't tell him to destroy them. Now you got to remember this. God only said Amalek. The Kenites are over there, and Saul said, "You better get out of Dodge. All hell's fixing to break loose." And what would be the best thing for them to do? In Acts chapter 2, Peter told the Israelites, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, save yourself from this untoward generation. Again, that kind of thing shows up, see. <clears throat> Peter thought the wrath of God was fixing to come on Israel and the repentant message and baptism was to Save them from what God's fixing to do to Israel for killing his son. Are you with me? They killed his son. That's Acts 2, 3, 4, 5. They crucified him. They murdered the Holy One or whatever. He said, save yourself by repenting and getting baptized. He that believeth in his baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. These signs shall follow them that believe. On and on. And they did. And so if you get baptized... You're saving yourself from that untoward generation. Get it. But God wasn't fixing to get them. Nobody knew it. He saved a Benjamite. 
Folks, you need to read your scripture, get real familiar with this, and go, holy mackerel, I missed this. He saved a Benjamite who in the Old Testament got smitten by Judah. Why? They were queers. A Levite priest had a concubine. This concubine played the whore. And I'm not making up words, folks. The scripture said she played the whore and left him, went home, played the whore. And after a while, he went to her, his, mother, his father-in-law's house to get her back. Boy, don't you see all this? He went to get her back. And while he's there, the father-in-law tells him, Stay with me another day. Don't go out. Emphasis. Lot. Stay another day. He, he landed up staying four extra days or something like that. Finally, he said, I'm leaving. I'm taking my concubine. I'm going. And he calls his concubine his wife. So concubines are wives. Even though they're called concubines, they have another relationship, I guess. And he heads out. He says, it's dark. You don't want to go. And they go. They get to a place, and it's turning dark on them. And they ain't got no place to stay. Oh, do you really know that you ain't got no place to stay? This ain't home. Can you lose your house quick? Here, Craig. Can you lose your house quick, Jerry? Can you go to Panama City and ask them, can you lose your house quick? A little wind. This ain't your home. He said, set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. You can lose it. And I mean quick. You can lose your temple, which is belongs to the Lord. It can get sick on you today and die tomorrow. Or die today. You can even break your arms like Gunner. He don't got no place to stay. Old man walks up. Been working in the field. And he said, I tell you, come on in my house. There's stuff for your asses to feed them and, and bring a cock by your family in. I'll feed you, whatever. And so they're in there making merry. Like M-E-R-R-Y. They're probably drinking. And the men of that city, Benjamites, circled around. They said, send that man out that we might know him. Now, you know what that means. And the old man said, I've got a daughter. And I've got his concubine. I'll send them out to you to satisfy you. Leave them alone. And they didn't want it. So finally the concubine was sent out. And they abused her all night. Till they killed her. She crawled to the door of the house. And died. And the Levite took her and put him on one of her asses. And went back home. And he cut her into 12 pieces. And sent her out. And after that, Israel went against Benjamin and smit him. Now, it's real. I'm telling you that. Saul, I want you to go over to the Amalekites. And I want you to kill everything that breathes. Saul went over there. He was favorable for the Canaanites. He said, get out of here. You didn't. You, you helped us in time. Amalek didn't. Amalek. Did not. He's going to be cursed. But you're blessed. Go. And when they came, laid wait, he took the king alive, he took women, and he took animals back. And Samuel went in there and he said, What's the bleeding of that sheep I hear? And who is that joker? And he took a sword and he cut that king into pieces. And he said, does the Lord 
respect, sacrifice over commandment. That's not a quote. In other words, does he? Did God tell you to kill it all? Does he respect your bringing me back a sacrifice over what he told you to do? That's what people are missing today. They think what they're doing overrides what God said. Uh-uh. Did you know one of the words that God used in the scripture for the wrongness that Benjamin did? Folly. Fa la 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 la. And Mary. If you think about that, it'll hit you. The mockery of God. In this season. Fa la 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 la. We're so happy. <laughs> it won't be funny at the judgment seat of Christ. Or the great white throne. Alright. That's all I got to say about that. Romans 9 verse 4. Who are Israelites to whom pertains the adoption. And the glory. And the covenants. And the what? And the what? That's the Levites. They serve the law. They serve God. They're Levites, right? The law was given by Moses, the mediator. He was a Levite. Aaron was the high priest. He was a Levite. So the law is as always associated with Levi. Correct? Are we on good ground right now? Okay. <clears throat> now turn to Matthew 1. Matthew chapter 1, verse 2. Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot... Uh, I'm pretty sure that Jacob, Israel, begot 12 of them. But who did he refer to? Judah. Judah, Judah, Judah. Right? Okay. Who came out of Judah? David. Isn't he in the genealogy down there about verse uh, 6? Okay, now look what God brings up. And Jesse begot David the king, and David the king begot who? So, by rightful heirship, where should the king be? In Solomon? Is he the son of David listed? Okay, let's just check it out. First Chronicles 2. Oh, Brother Jerry, you got us in Chronicles? <laughs> All things written a fourth time written for our learning. You know that you can learn a lot of things from Chronicles. Say, I just can't get over all the begottens and the begats and the whatever. First Chronicles 2, verse 1. These were the sons of Israel. Reuben, Simon, Levi, Judah, Iskar, Zebulun, Dan, Joseph, Benjamin, Nathalia, uh, Naphtali. Gad, Asher. Okay? Then what does he list in verse 3? Sons of Judah. I just read you 12 and yet he points out one, doesn't he? The sons of Judah. Okay? Then Judah, verse 15. Ozium the sixth, David what? David the seventh. Who's that out of? Verse 13. Jesse. So you got to have the genealogy right in David. Correct? Now you're the God of this world and you know that there's been promises of kingship. There's been promises of a king coming. 
All right, the throne of David, then you know there's going to be a throne of David sitting on it. Somebody's going to be sitting on the throne of David. All right, the next in line of David is who's the next king? Solomon. Folks, how important is Solomon? Built the temple. Solomon's temple, right? So the, the devil's looking at him, he's going, hmm, there he is. We got to mess this man up. Solomon's the king. Anything from him has got to be messed up because somewhere in there, there's a king coming who will sit on the throne of David. Correct? Am I, am I with you? Am I doing something wrong? Should I quit? Okay. Well, let's check some things out. Turn with me to Luke 3. Now the genealogy starts with Jesus in verse 23 and Jesus himself being uh, began to be about 30 years of age being as was supposed the son of Joseph which was the son of Eli. Now Joseph's daddy is not listed over Matthew and Eli. For sure. Hold your finger go to Matthew 1. Matthew 1, 16, uh, 15. Elad begot Eleazar, Eleazar begot Methan, and Methan begot Jacob. And Jacob begot who? The husband. You know, so King James will always preserve the deity of Christ. Joseph just the husband, isn't he? Who's his daddy? Who's your daddy? It's Joseph. Who's his daddy? Verse 16, Matthew 1. Jacob. Isn't that what it says? Hey, uh, Joseph, who's your daddy? Luke 3. Verse 23. And Jesus himself being uh, began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, which was the son of who? Well, I, I'm confused now. Yeah. I either Jacob or Eli's the daddy, right? No, who was Joseph's daddy-in-law? That's right. They call him dad. Craig would refer to me as his father, yet he puts father-in-law, but I'm actually his father because he came into my family. So straighten up, son. <laughs> Eli's his dad-in-law, and there's a reason for this. And it's a verse uh, 20, uh, 31 in Luke 3. Which was the son of Eli, which was the son of Menan, which was the son of Matthiah, which was the son of... Uh-oh, where'd that character come from? Folks, there's a change coming. Biden says it's going to be a dark winter. He wasn't kidding. It is. But there's a change coming here in the Scripture. The God's world is going to mess with Solomon's lineage. He's got to. Solomon's mother's Bathsheba. He's got a brother named Nathan. That means they're both, what? Out of David. One of them is just in the background there. He ain't nothing. He's just Nathan. But if you check the genealogies, it stops in Matthew and Luke at one place, and there ain't the same from then on. And it starts Solomon's lineage, Nathan's lineage in Luke 3. Now, who's going to be in lineage, uh, Nathan's lineage? Yeah, amen. Amen. Praise God. Now, Mary is a virgin. 
and her child comes from who? God, the Holy One, right? Holy Ghost come upon her. Okay? She's of the same lineage of David, but she's out of a different child. The one the devil ain't messing with. I ain't going no farther. You get this. He ain't messing with that lineage. Because he can't. It's hid. And one day, a woman is born out of Nathan, whose name is Mary, who is prophesied to be the virgin that would bear a son, and his name would call Jesus, whose father is heavenly father God, and he will be able to sit on the throne, for he's tempted in all points like as we are yet new, no sin. In Solomon's lineage is a bad guy in the kingship. And God said for about this king, he said, Of this man's seed, no one will ever sit on the throne of David. What tribe is David out of? Levi. Judah. I'm just saying if you're listening. <laughs> He's of the tribe of Judah. Well, how can there be a new priesthood? What is it evident? Our priest, high priest, sprang out, sprang out of the tribe of what? If there's going to be a new king, there's going to be a new law. Boy, I feel like I'm missing it. Hebrews 7. And if you want to check the lineages, you go to Matthew, you write down all the genealogies on one side of the paper. Then you go to Luke 3 and write all the genealogies, and you're going to find there comes a point, and they're different from then on. And you'll find that Luke goes all the way back to God, and Matthew goes to Abraham. Is everybody with me? Okay. Turn to Hebrews again. Well, if you got people all around you teaching the law, you got all these people claim to know the scripture, and they don't have any idea about the priesthood change. Okay, Hebrews chapter 7 again. Hebrews 7, verse 14 again. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of the tribe of who? Judah. Of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning what? The priesthood. All right, now let's just see. This is not the tribe of the priesthood. Judah, you read it, right? Are we correct? All right. Hebrews 7, verse 11. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek. And if you want to explain to me about Melchizedek, go ahead. I'll give you a few minutes. It probably won't take but about a minute or less. Melchizedek had no father, had no mother. Uh-huh. And he is represented that Abraham <clears throat> gave his tithes <clears throat> from taking Lot out of Sodom and Gomorrah, the spoil. He gave all the tithe of the spoil. Spoil to Melchizedek. Who in the world is Melchizedek? He's a priest. No father, no mother. And a real mystery in this scripture. And this is before the law. Tithing is part of the law. That's one of the commandments. The Levites were commanded to tell them to, they had to perform their uh, tithe and whatever. But Abraham gave tithes before the law. Because it was something he received of the Lord. Somebody said, well, Abraham gave a tenth of all he had. No, he gave a tenth of the spoil. That's what it said. Okay? What do the churches believe they should do now? Okay. Ten percent is a set of a figure. And it can get to be where it is habit-forming. 
I don't know if you understand what I'm telling you, but people set down a rule and they say, this is what I'm going to give. Is that cheerful? What about turning over to the Lord and say, Lord, I do not know what that person needs, but help me to know. Lead me and guide me. People all the time tell me, Brother Jerry, could you, could you send me a bill every month so I can tithe to you? No. I ain't send you a bill. I said a cheerful heart is a person that's concerned about what the Lord gives him versus what, what's he receiving. Miss Barrett, Miss Barrett, did you say that you love me? Why did you say you love me one time? Did you say one time you love me? I sure did. <laughs> then couldn't you think about me? Always. See, that's what I'm telling you, folks. People think. Say, Lord, you know, when old Paul, the Lord appeared, he said, what would you have me to do? What if the Lord had told him, you're going to the Gentiles right now? Huh? That, I think that progressively worked on Paul. You know what I'm saying? It, he had to get him ready. I mean, it's like, you know. And see, if you receive spiritual things from me, what should you really do? Carnal things to me. Am I not carnal? I'm flesh. Do I live of the gospel? Then cheerful is supplying that need. If I'm willing, as the scriptures say, to live of it, then you cheerfully do that. That, that, The the idea of Abraham, when he went and got that spoil, it's his, isn't it? Didn't God let him? He went in there and got his nephew out, Lot, which he considered as his son also. He went and got his son. He brought him out, and he's got all this spoil. Now, are you listening? Saul was told to kill everything and don't bring nothing back. God didn't want nothing of it. God don't want nothing of religion. You can't offer what religion's doing to God as they worship. I hope I'm not missing you. If religion all agree with it, you better step back. You cannot offer religious things to God. He don't want it. I don't want nothing breathing when you leave there, Saul. How'd you like to be told that, Robert? I want you to go over to Montgomery and kill everything that breathes. Don't you realize that God's going to laugh at derision one day and kill a third of the earth? It's, I don't know. Don't you understand that the things that are happening before your eyes are truly what you really didn't expect to happen in your life after all? They're coming together quicker than you can ever imagine. And one of these days that Bible is going to be fulfilled. And if you're not ready, you better close your eyes and get ready because you're going to leave this place. Because it's coming together. Oh, the preacher's been preaching on that for 2,000 years. Yeah, but there's an end to that 2,000 years one of these days. And you might be the generation that's living in it when it happens. Say, I wish you wouldn't scare my children. Your children better be scared. You better have them thinking about the Lord. Because God told Saul, go in and kill them all. And Saul wouldn't do it. And he says rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. What, that's what Samuel told him. He said, you don't need your sacrifice. You bring back them animals. What are you going to do with them, Saul? Are you going to offer them up to God? He told you to kill them. And what's them women you brought back? They're going to breed with your men. And they're idolaters. What's that king doing here? I told you to kill him. And so he took a sword out and he hewed that old boy up. Man, old boy thought he had it made. Hey, hey at least Saul brought me back. I'm going to be able to live in the king's house or something. Whop, 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 whop. A dead day for him, wasn't it? Dead day coming for people that they won't believe. If they won't receive the love of the truth, their damnation coming. 
And one of the reasons is the churches have never seen the priest, the high priest, Judah, which has nothing to do with us. And yet they're placing the old law on us when there's a new law and a new priesthood. Now let's read. Everybody okay so far? Yeah. Hebrews 11, uh, 7, verse 12. For the priesthood being changed, also there's made, there is made of necessity a change also of what? How long has that been written? About 2,000 years, maybe? Do, do you think they're, they're missing that or something? How can I put something on you that's been changed? Okay. He says, uh, verse 13, For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. That's Levi versus Judah. Nobody did anything for Judah. I mean, Judah's... By the way, in the Old Testament, you know, the Old Testament, the tribes of Judah shall be saved first in the second coming. Wow, what, what's so big about Judah? It's evident our Lord sprang out of the tribe of Judah. Okay, Hebrews 8, 1. Now the things which we have spoken, that's Hebrews 7, this is the sum. We have such an high priest, who is set on the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. When he made the tabernacle on earth, when he told them to make the tabernacle in the wilderness, it was set up for the three tribes on the north, three tribes on the south, three tribes on the east, and three tribes on the west. Inside, at the entrance was... Uh, the, where the priesthood could go enter into the tabernacle and do service to God. Then the inside curtain was where the Holy of Holies was, and nobody could enter in there except the high priest once a year. The high priest went in there in that Holy of Holies once a year with blood, and he kept God from seeing the sins of the people that year. So he was making propitiation for sins that were past. Which is Romans 3. Jesus Christ made propitiation through his blood for the sins of past of Israel. Because God's going to save them one day. Therefore shall all Israel shall be saved in the tribulation and the millennial. I'm getting tired. Maybe I'm not doing something right. <laughs> <clears throat> Hebrews 8, 1. So, Hebrews 3. Now, you understand how important the book of Hebrews is about the priesthood? Hebrews 3, 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, not the high calling, as Paul talks about it, the heavenly calling, Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession. Say it out loud. Who is their apostle and who is their high priest? Amen, Leon. That's what it says, ain't it? Who's your apostle? Paul. And he never once mentions you as a priesthood. But somebody does in the Bible. Now watch. Turn with me to 1 Peter. <clears throat> if you think of a palace and a city with the palace, what do you consider living in there? There's a word, and it starts with an R. Let's say it again. Royalty. Okay, 1 Peter 2, <clears throat> Royalty. Verse 9, you are a chosen generation, a what? There they are. Now, who are they? Well, Peter's the minister of the circumcision. 
the circumcision who? That will repent, get baptized, and save themselves the untoward generation. They will die under the fear of they must not go against the Holy Ghost. He whoever blasphemes against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven. In this world, the world to come. If a man sees his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall pray for him. But he will not pray for that sin which is unto death. And that's blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Hebrews 6, if a man is partaker of that heavenly blessing. And that, uh, I, I apologize. I'm not going to say it without getting it right. Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6, verse 4. For it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they should fall away to renew them again under repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves uh, the Son of God afresh and put him to open shame, can they renew a blaspheme against the Holy Ghost? No, sir. Can you blaspheme against the Holy Ghost? The only thing you can do is grieve it. That's Ephesians 4.30. Why can't you blaspheme against the Holy Ghost? Because it wasn't doctrine given to you. You're not a royal priesthood. It's a sin. Aren't you dead to sin? Oh, that's really good, ain't it? Uh-huh. So are the people that Peter were preaching to in Acts, uh, 1 Peter 2.9, royal priesthood? <clears throat> well, well, well. Look with me in Revelation chapter 1. I hear these Revelation seminars. Them idiots don't know nothing of what they're talking about. Revelation chapter 1, verse 6. Well, let's get the idea of what this is. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him. Who did God give it to? Okay. To show his servants. So who is it to? Okay. Things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by who? His angel. Not an angel. His angel. So you got God... Tells Jesus. Jesus is going to tell his servants. In Revelation they're called 144,000. Which will not take the mark of the beast. God gives it to Jesus. Jesus is going to give it to the servants. He gives it to his angel. To go to who? John. John, the revelator. Now, am I going to teach this book to you? No. You see what I'm saying? Isn't that absolutely, I mean, you, you're reading it black and white. It ain't to you. It, Revelation seminars aren't to you. And if it ain't to you, then it ain't going to happen to you. I'm trying to get you comfort here of what things are going on around you being talked about and everything. It ain't to you. You will be saved from wrath. It's not appointed unto you for wrath. And the wrath of God only comes in tribulation. The will of God right now is for all men to be saved. He is not laughing at their derision, the foolishness and the things that are going on. He's not laughing at it. The will of God is for you to be saved. The gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation. If our gospel be hid, it's hid to them or lost. In whom the God's world blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them. Folks, we're dealers of light, not darkness. The glorious gospel of Christ, the light. We're dealers of it. We deal it. Brother Moore gave me a Bible one time. He said, life is like a card game. It's in my little Bible. And he says, it's a, a deal in the hand. God deals the hand. You got to live with it. Five card stud. You don't get to draw. You don't have the one-eyed Jackson Joker's wild. It's five card stud. 
and you deal. The Lord deals it to you. You've got to live with it. And you make your bet on Him or you lose. During this time of darkness, seven days, me and Kathy played a lot of cards. She cheats. <laughs> no, she she's waving at me. No, she just lucky, I guess. She did. I mean, we'd be playing rummy, and she'd lay them all down. I go, I didn't even get to play. And then go a couple of hands, then she lay them all down. I, you know, I'm going, I'm shuffling them. It didn't matter when I shuffled, she'd still do it. But then every once in a while, when she said I cheated. But we had a lot of fun. Why? We had nothing else to do. Hey, we're too old to have kids. So we play cards. <laughs> All right, now watch. <clears throat> Signified by his angel unto his servant John. So wait just a minute what he's going to signify. Verse 6. And hath made us. You say it with me. Kings and priests. unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So the servants are the kings and the priests. So Peter's talking to them, and they're called a royal priesthood. And if Judah becomes the law, where it comes from, then the Levitical law is gone. And if the Levitical law is gone, why would anybody be teaching the Levitical law on Gentiles which didn't have the law in the first place? Because they're blind. Christ died for our sins according to Scripture. He was buried and He rose again the third day. Glorious gospel of Christ. If you trust that, you're saved. Don't let nobody ever hoodwink you into the fact you've got to keep the law. Nor the works of the law or anything about the law. Is the law good? The law is spiritual. But the law could not make anybody perfect, nor could it save. It was a schoolmaster to teach Israel they needed God in this card game. You know, it's fun playing poker when you use one-eyed jacks and jokers and everything. I mean, you can get six, six aces, you know, I mean, nobody can stand up against six aces, can they? <laughs> uh, you, got, you got five aces in your hand. How'd you get that? Well, I got three aces, a one-eyed jack, and joker. And I'm making that a ace. Well, I don't think they even rule on five aces in a card game, do they? So that had to be made up by man, didn't it? Sure as a world. There's a lot of things made up by man. Don't fall for it. Trust what God says. Get in your Bible and start reading. And ask the Lord to say, Show me who it's written to, what it's about, and then get in Paul's letters and read it and say, Oh my God, this is my doctrine. Show me more and more so that I can have comfort in this evil world, in this vile body, and I can walk your paths with you directing me. Amen?